Hello out there. Welcome again to our AutoCrit Live program. I'm here with Gareth. As you can see, we're going to be talking about line editing, which might not sound like a lot of fun, but trust us, we can make anything fun. Hopefully. <laughs> I believe I believe in us, Gareth. Uh, we have people uh, watching this from all over. Look at this. We have Ohio, Georgia, Delaware, Idaho, Washington State, Philadelphia, Ohio, Las Vegas. That's so, uh, that's awesome. Some people have snow. Um, I live in Florida, so nope, no, no snow here. Um, actually, though, it was weird. I was getting food at a restaurant, and there was this big block of ice. Like, it looked like it had snowed in just one random spot. And I have no idea why that happened. So I was like, that's a writing prompt. Like, <laughs> in the bank, in the parking <laughs> space in the fast food restaurant was a snow bank. I was like, why? Why is this here? So well, That's often what you see when, when things are thawing as well after a big snow. It's like everything's clear, and then there's just this one big yeah, one, one little patch. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I have lived in snow once. I lived in Canada for a year, so I have experienced seasons once. I kind of know what they are. <laughs> Usually not though. <laughs> East Tennessee, nice area. Indianapolis, Capistrano. All right. So, if you joined us last week, and if you didn't, well, you can always go back and watch it later. But we are going through after the draft, which is after your first draft. So last week we discussed uh, the first steps, the first steps of doing developmental editing, looking at your draft before you get down to the nitty gritty line editing. So if you haven't done a developmental edit, don't do this yet. Go back, watch the other video, because as you'll notice in the other video, it's not a good idea to do line editing until you've done that develop editing first. Uh, Gareth, you want to speak a little bit about that difference again for the people that didn't catch it, the just, you know, develop edit and the line editing? Yeah, sure. Well, the I mean, the developmental side of things uh, is revising based on story. So once you've gotten your first draft down, you're going to read through and really check that the story actually makes sense. Because <laughs> often we can come to the table with a really great idea, what we feel is a really great idea, and kind of let that flow out of us. But of course, with the first draft, there's a lot of getting ideas down, say, you know, uh, spot decisions and things like that. And it doesn't necessarily come together structurally uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as a great story. So I think it's um, part of this series, this whole After the Draft series, there's three parts, um, and it's a process that we recommend, well, I recommend personally, um, kind of molding your revision process into, uh, which will start with developmental side of things. Because at the end of the day, I tend to hate uh, spending lots and lots of time fixing the writing itself on a line editing level, um, and some of the more stranger conceptual things that we'll get to in the third part uh mm -hmm. putting all that effort in only to realize that structurally nothing works um that it needs to be shifted right. around and blended in and really molded because then you're going to have to do all the line editing stuff again on the new parts mm -hmm. and on what you've fixed uh which can lengthen the process so i like to do that first to make sure i'm really happy with the story before just tidying up the writing itself uh, so exactly. that's what developmental is all about that developmental revision that you can do make sure that the story is all good with you uh, and of course that's not to say that i think once you get to the end of all three parts of this big process that uh, everything is going to be 100 percent perfect because kind of coming off the end oh, of that yes, it will. No, is <laughs> is getting more feedback um that's like the final you know spoiler alert that's the final final kind of area is getting all the feedback mm -hmm. that you can on it and of course uh, helping uh, getting other editors to help with the, the work. So it's going to it's going to go beyond this, but this is the confined to your your self-editing approach, what you're doing personally in your revisions. So I definitely recommend starting with the, the developmental side of things, story, characters, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of structure and organization, uh, plot points, looking out for plot holes and things like that. Um, so if you have not yet done that, or you've got a book there and you're thinking, I'll jump right in on my simple line edit, Take a look at last week's first. Um, yeah. It's also mm -hmm. in written form, so you don't have to sit and listen to us for an hour to get uh, all the details on it. You can read it if you like, and that's over at uh, autocrit.com forward slash blog. Uh, we have uh, articles on there. And I believe um, if you want to reference today's uh, steps as well, there's an article on the blog right now for this one too. So feel free to pop over there and you can get it in writing. Fantastic. And, you know, I know people, too, often like to, to do both. You know, you like to hear it, and then you like to read it as a reference tool afterwards. So we, yeah, that's we one of these things. People, people like to interact and, and learn in different ways. So 
Exactly. And if you have any questions, we have some people here online live with us, which is awesome. If you have any questions as we go and you need some clarification or some tips and tricks that you use, uh, feel free to chime in, you know, the wisdom of crowds for sure. So do you want to dive right into this simple line edit process, Gareth? Sound good? Yes, indeed. Let me check. I was, you know, you ever see anything and said we're doing it live, but uh, since I was talking about the blog version, I popped over to the blog to check that it had posted and it hasn't. So uh, just refreshing that to make sure it's available for everybody. That is available right now. You uh, got that hot, hot off the press. So <laughs> Somebody had to hit that button. And now we're going to been... dig in to uh, going through today's now that we're done more or less with our developmental side of things. So if you followed through the first part last week, um, you've got that all done. You're super happy with the way the story flows. Um, yes, all great. your characters are great. Um, Fantastic. Off the page, you're just you're loving it. It's a really I, great idea. Fantastic. And all that time spent because there's a lot of time, <laughs> and, right? and there's still still a lot of time to go, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's worth the effort at the end, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately for for what you hold in your hands. Not many people, you know. Uh, this is one of the things that I uh, always mention when we get to the end of all of this too. Is so many people dream. Uh, I'll constantly dream and talk and have great ideas and always. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book. Uh, of that the number of people that do that very few actually finish the process uh, mm -hmm. and that's because it's, it's not easy um, no. you can have things to make it easier auto crit for example but it's right. not easy um, at the core no. of it uh, so so many people give up but that's it why it's work. worth putting the time in yeah it does it is work mm -hmm. yeah um, however um, and <clears throat> and I think that's kind of the difference between the people that get product out there or I mean I don't mean product in the commercial way just you know they're producing something and people that like you said just kind of sit idly by is the people that know how to make that transition where it's like i have this passion and love and that doesn't go away but there's a certain point in which yeah then it becomes maintenance and becomes a little bit rough around the edges and then you that passion has to keep moving you through all that and the people that can make that transition they're the ones that are producing works getting things out there the people that can't they're like well i just don't love this anymore they just drift away or they, they don't do it so you know, let that passion carry you through, but dive into the work. That's my thought. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And uh, I can see we have our first step there on our slide. So we'll begin uh, in this one. We're moving into, as you can tell, line editing. I would try to, in my personal approach, just take some of the easier. That's why it's the, called the simple line edit. Some of mm. it's not so simple. Um, but it's the simpler parts, uh, which I think are easiest to get you rolling uh, quickly. And of course, uh, as we'll see, especially with our first uh, first one after this, <laughs> is uh, some of the things that give you quick wins, um, a, a nice little boost. Because coming from the developmental edit, that's again a lot of work. You put a lot of mind, uh, you know, brain power into that. You're maybe feeling a little drained and a bit uh, at this point already because of the work. So we want to get you some quick wins, uh, a little bit of fire uh, in your belly. And before the, uh, you know, we really dive into the fire in your belly, we want to let the fire that you had burning before die down a bit. Uh, because again, you want to come into your line editing with as clear a view as possible, which means letting it rest again. Uh, mm -hmm. If you remember from the developmental edit, we said after you've actually written your first draft and you've got to the, the end and you typed the end and hopefully went and jumped around a little and shouted at somebody and danced and uh, gave yourself a little treat is you let it sit for a while uh, before you nice. go back and start revising. Let it sink to the back of your mind so you can come back as fresh as possible. And we're going to do that again. Uh, you know, yep. again, spoiler, it kind of happens in between each of these steps giving yourself some distance because uh, with the amount of work you're putting in, you um, can get frustrated and frustration clouds your judgment. And that's what this is all about, making sure that you're not stuck in a cyclical hell of indecision and trying to fix things <laughs> here and there uh, because of bad judgment. We want You to can also get desensitized to the excitement you had, right? It's kind of like yeah. they say absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? Um, you, when you're just in the thick of it over and over and over again the fun of it you know the, those exciting sparks can kind of dull dull down a bit because you're just thinking logistically and so taking a step back and coming back you're like oh yeah actually this is a really cool scene or this is really a cool concept i actually am excited about it it can help with that at least i find so yeah and uh, once we're done 
resting. So the, the amount of time actually resting is, is sort of up to you. You know, your mileage may vary, the how long you need to take. Um, but uh, usually recommend about a week or two um, at the minimum to, to let it rest. But of course, you can take a few days if you're somebody who can easily just kind of drop in and out uh, of what's clouding up your, uh, your brain space. And an important step, as we can see there, thank you, Daniel, do these next things one at a time. Uh, now, part of why we created, um, sort of came up with this whole uh, idea of after the draft, again, these three parts, is intended to help you systematize your editing process. So you can mm -hmm. actually step by step, almost like a checklist or a blueprint to what you're doing, um, follow it through from beginning to end. So this is the order I recommend, and I don't recommend jumping between things, you know, kind of willy-nilly, uh, picking one and, and trying the next and everything. Um, there are good reasons why mm -hmm. one will necessarily lead into the next. And that's uh, partly, you know, because of you don't want to fix something that's going to cause problems in something that you fixed earlier. Um, again, just causing you more work. But like I said a minute ago, cognitively, things like getting big wins quick so you get more yes. motivation uh, is a good uh, reason to, to do things in a certain order. Um, you're, if you're experienced enough with editing and you've done it loads in all your books, maybe you have your own process too, in which case you do you. You know, whatever works for you, do it best. But um, yeah. for your first few, if you're if you're beginning, this right. is how I recommend tackling it. Right. Let's just like anything else in life, like dieting or accounting or something like that. Most people tell you, don't try to tackle all your problems all at the same time, right? They tell you to to prioritize, get some good habits in, then you then you do another one, you do it because you can only hold so much in your head at once. Like, and you'll just overwhelm yourself. If yeah, and, and some of these things too. I mean, it takes practice getting good at this. Uh, I think, like I said last week, there's a lot of. Um, sort of questioning that goes on when you're thinking you know am i am i able to edit my own stuff i mean i'm not an editor right. if, if that's in your mind you know i've not trained i've not uh, got guidance on how to do this uh, in a professional manner uh, you don't want to make that worse because yes you know initially it, it only serves you it behooves you to do self-editing first um so that you can well age save time get get to market faster start selling your books faster um i mean you could skip the editing to sell your books faster but you're not going to sell very yeah. many um, or <laughs> get very very fat, bad bad feedback on it um but uh when you've done some good self-editing and you're in a good place with it, it 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 expedites the second half of the process when you're dealing with someone else and, and kind of getting there so you're not going through round after round after round after round with with an actual another editor who is trained you are going to go that way eventually but as i said it behooves you initially to do this and when there it takes practice to get used to a number of the things so what you really don't want to do is to be jumping in with something that you are really not good at, um, that you don't quite understand yet, and really put yourself off. Again, there's a cognitive effect there where you start to hate it because you're not very good at that one thing. Yeah. Put that thing to the end. Um, get a lot of wins in first, and then come around to the thing that you're not so good at, uh, and maybe get some help there. You know, um, but give yourself, uh, I guess, treat yourself kindly when it comes to it. That's right. Exactly. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, what do we have here? weed out the filler yeah step number one um after we've done our kind of resting and we've uh, given our ourselves some time away we're going to come in for step number one and this is the what i call the quick win factory weed out the filler which is searching for filler words uh we all love those don't we i think uh most of us here viewing or listening will uh, know what a filler word is there those little little words like that or just or what have you got? Then, really, <laughs> very, even, uh, you know, do you even, uh, whatever, bro. Those you, are... Do you even filler? <laughs> yeah, do you even filler word, bro? Is the... Uh, they're, they're, they're almost superfluous um, mm -hmm. most of the time uh, when they're in a sentence. And this uh, part of tackling this first, like I said, is, is for that boost. Um, <clears throat> when you start to find them and weed them out the the real way to tell if they can be taken out is going to be um if you can remove them from the sentence and the sentence still parses absolutely fine you know it's still completely understandable yep. um and it's also delivering the effect that you wanted to deliver of course but if you can go through and, and remove those you're cutting down your word count hey hey cost less to print um cuts down your uh you know, how, how it looks to a prospective publisher as well. If something that's, you know, uh, 120,000 words and you end up killing, uh, not that it's that extreme, but like 3,000 in filler alone uh, is a really good place to be. And uh, part of this quick win thing is that, yep, it's easy to do. 
And I find that as you do it, it's one of those places that you immediately start to feel like your writing is cleaner. Um, it just it looks feels more precise. Not, yeah. Yeah, it looks it's a lot that better. Stuff just bogs down, especially if, you know, and newer writers might use a lot more filler words because they're just not thinking about it. Because filler words, you, they're the kind of things that come up a lot in language uh, when we're talking. And in uh, when we're talking, it doesn't, you know, the ums and whatever, that can be frustrating, but it's not nearly as frustrating as when you read it written. Like when we, when we look at writing, we don't expect that to be there. So when you can get rid of it, it immediately makes you look a lot smarter. And yeah, better. yeah. Everything becomes more concise. Um, and that's just getting your point across clearly. Um, I see a, a couple of comments there. Uh, Ed, yeah. good to see you, Ed. Uh, thought on using filler words in dialogue. Dialogue is the exception um, mm -hmm. in a number of these things. Uh, people use filler words in dialogue all the time. Um, and also speak quite imprecisely in dialogue. Um, we can ramble and all sorts. <laughs> so uh, di dialogue is like a dialogue is its own little area. And yes, if you see them in dialogue, don't tackle it there first. Um, we're talking about narrative prose here. Uh, it's mostly mm -hmm. where the filler turns up. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, Esquire, I love the Mark Twain advice. Every time you would use the word really, use the word damn instead so your editor takes it out for you. Yeah. <laughs> Little things like that. So, there was... Um, very, I, is a, very is a word that you could almost always get rid of. because it's Yeah, very, because uh, again, very modifies something so very fast. Um, you know, could be speeding or uh, some other better word that uh, mm -hmm. just completely encompasses what you're trying to say or what you're trying to bolster with very um or really as much along the same lines you know really fast versus very fast that kind of thing um so yeah filler words i think is, is just a real quick one uh to get started and start to um tighten up your sentences make the writing seem a lot better and in turn make you feel better about it because i think it's just there's something about it to me that just starts to feel really cool when you're taking those out and you're like oh, okay yeah this writing's tight uh this is good. um that kind of gets you pumped for moving on to the next to the next spot um to now answer, when it comes to filler words to answer uh, 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 uh christopher's question of course just like you don't want to hear a speaker and they're like um yeah whatever all the time of course it can be it can be irritating if a, if somebody in dialogue is using it too much it can yeah. certainly make them sound rather indecisive or unclear or kind of weak which maybe isn't intentional but if it's not it can really mess with the reader yeah, there was a, a couple of examples. I was just looking them up there to see what examples I used um, in our written version uh, of this today as well. And uh, a couple that were quite interesting for this. For example, if you this is a use of really as well as that, we have a sentence which would be, there were 15 different ways that the task could really be tackled. And something like that, mm -hmm. you can easily zap the filler words in there. There were 15 different ways the task could be tackled. Yes. Simple. Um, now, the word really there could be an exception because you could be using really for effect, could really be tackled. You know, it depends mm -hmm. on what you're going with. So always be cognizant of what it is you're trying to do. Um, the second one that I had kind of versus that is, is one of my own. He braced himself for the inevitable agony that would follow that awful mouth bearing down on his head. And both uses of that in that sentence are necessary. He braced himself the inev inevitable agony that would follow. The sentence would break if we just took that out. Agony would follow. And that awful mouth. So we've already been introduced to the mouth. The fact that we're using the word that is simply referring to something that we're already aware of. So that's necessary. You can't just nuke those out of the sentence and have it make any sense. So mm -hmm. just always be thinking like that when you're coming through. Um, you'll tend to find that more classic styles or literary styles will often make more use of the word that filling in the sentences because it sets up a natural kind of rhythm and cadence to it that feels more formal um and that will often come through in literary style writing so don't feel like you need to nuke it all if that's the tone you're going for just kind of be aware of that um but of course again like anything as, as easy and as fulfilling and quick winny as uh, this one is uh you know it is still work um easiest way around it is let's give a plug for something like autocrit which will find them just like that <laughs> just like that <laughs> just like that i like that gareth yeah the nice thing about the autocrit software is that it finds it it finds the different uh filler words so you don't have to do that control f 
replace or whatever you're going to do in Word. That's what I used to do before AutoCrit. I had the six most common, you know, just that very, and I looked for it myself manually, which that's a lot more time consuming than a report like this, where it's going to show you all of them as you go through. And not only does it show you all of the filler words, it shows you which ones you're using more often than is normal, which is very helpful as well, rather than just what's a filler word, right? Yes, and indeed. And at your particular tick, because everybody has them. For me, it was that. <laughs> I get a lot of that. And, you know, as, as how this can go too, I was talking um with some of our class members in the the horror course that's currently running just last week uh because i was working on a piece and uh, focused on filler words at that time and speaking of autocrit's recommendations compared to the horror genre setting i think i had 140 uh filler words initially detected and the recommendations for removing i, I think it was that was remove just one um, at the end, I decided, you know what, that's good. I know that I'm in a good spot here uh, for the genre, but I'm going to go ahead and remove all the ones that I know can possibly go. And I ended up taking it down from 140 to about 112. So there was a, a good chunk that went there beyond just the one that was recommended. But it, it is good that you you get some guidance there, too, to help you kind of settle into the, the space that you want to be in. Good for that confidence too, you know. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to the next step. How about eradicating adverbs? Sounds like uh, Stephen King's favorite activity. Yes. Moving <laughs> on to the next, uh, again, kind of easy one, and uh, <laughs> I put this in the in the written article because it makes me chuckle. I'm sorry if it doesn't make anybody else else chuckle. Uh, but I wrote when you absolutely, positively, unequivocally need to paint a clear and impactful picture, don't use adverbs. Um, <laughs> A good example. Just, just don't do it. Yeah, the <laughs> most of the time they're 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 quite useless. Um, however, this is to say, um, always remember that sometimes they're fine. You know, again, just like the filler words, not everything that is, is a potential filler word is a filler word in reality in the context within which you've used it. So the same goes with adverbs. But most of the time, all they're doing again is just adding more words, and we're using them to modify things um, where. We could just have a simple, better verb um, mm -hmm. saying that somebody uh, cried loudly, for example. Um, you know, you, there's loads of words that fit in there, wailed, shrieked, mm -hmm. yelped. Um, and, and the good thing is that um, different verbs paint different feelings and different contexts. So it, in that context where I said he cried loudly, um, you could use words like a word like wailed um, would, to me, usually insinuate emotional damage um somebody wailing in grief for example uh somebody shrieking would usually be in horror shriek is a reaction most of the time and yelping to uh, a sharp pain physically um you know there's a lot of different they all mean the same thing made a loud noise a alarming noise however based on which one you go for you paint a different feel you give an appropriate uh, idea of what happened to that person or what may have happened to that person if we don't know yet. Um, so you can use that to your benefit in the storytelling. Way, way better than just saying, cried loudly, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So adverbs for that reason kind of suck. They're not uh, They're not great. Um, mm -hmm. And act almost like a bit of filler as well. So mm -hmm. at this point, we're going through the manuscript looking specifically for adverbs. Uh, we can plug again. Autocrate makes it super easy to find them all. So yeah. uh, you can speed up the process <laughs> there. Um, and and uh, as it was in your example, don't forget adverbs can modify adverbs, and that's where they can really, really, uh, they can really uh, go crazy because you can just put adverb on adverb on adverb, and they just m multiply, and it, you can end up with sentences like the one Gareth pointed out in his example, where it's <laughs> very purple and bleh. <laughs> now the difference here as well, one of the things to remember too is keep dialogue, uh, the actual content of dialogue, what people are saying as its own little realm. Uh, we're definitely yes. talking about narrative prose here because once more, people talk with filler and people talk with adverbs and people talk imprecisely yeah. and uh, yeah. natural speech. You don't want your actual dialogue itself to come off as unnatural. So mm -hmm. keep that to one side. Uh, that's yeah. a whole uh, a whole other realm. Um, really good is fine for dialogue, probably shouldn't be in your prose, but depends. Yeah, well, it depends. Um, sometimes your your prose, especially in a first person narrative, really embedded in someone's mind might sound like they're vocal, you know, the way they speak uh, exactly. all the way through, but not all the time. Again, it's right. very contextual, depends on, on what you're going for. But mm -hmm. ultimately, at the end of the day, for 
uh, great fiction, especially commercial fiction, economy of words is very, very important. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to be precise to the point and specific as much as possible. And speaking that usually means getting rid of adverbs. Cool. But speaking of specific, that's our next step. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me make it a little adjustment here because my uh, my name is blocking it. Oh, wait, can I fix it? Oh. <laughs> I think we can, we can get the idea. Here we go. Oh. Aim for specificity, which means avoiding generic descriptions. So like mm -hmm. I just said, yeah, that was a good segue. I did that unintentionally. Um, the best things happen live. Now, <laughs> specificity, yeah, it doesn't only apply when we're dealing with adverbs. In this case, we're talking about generic description. Um, yes. Now, generic description, again, is when you're just using really plain language. Again, like think of uh, that filler word, very, or really, very large, really large. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, big, nice. Uh, they're all really, really flat. You know, they're, they're not really generating anything at all. And mm -hmm. the problem with this, um, keeping things too generic, is uh, now again, your intent may be buried in this. And if it is, then kind of, you know, have your cake and eat it. But otherwise, if you uh, want to be as involving as possible, understand that as we are reading uh, stories, we're kind of creating these images drawn in our minds, you know, we're visualizing it in a, in a sense. But as we're doing that, those images that we draw are really fleeting. They're, they're there and gone as we're moving on line by line, sentence by sentence, um, to the degree that, you know, I've spoken with some people who are just like, when people are reading books or when you're reading books, this, my wife actually said this to me, when you're reading books, are you actually seeing it? inside your head like your imagination mm -hmm. is, is actually it's like a, a an actual movie mm -hmm. and i'm like well to some degree yes um as as, as a character is moving through the space i'm imagining it yes playing in a uh, mm -hmm. playing a, inside my head and she's like i don't get that at all i'm just seeing the words and it's going mm -hmm. through but i would argue that the the reality of that is probably somewhere in the middle um, between both of us, but it's so fast, you know, it, it processes, it happens so quickly that she doesn't see that, uh, kind of mm -hmm. grasp it as it, as it flies by. And because of that kind of thing, it's easy to imagine, uh, that readers don't actually need specific detail. It's like, you know, well, the image is going to be there and then gone. So why do they need, um, me to be mm -hmm. so specific? And the problem, I mean, the answer to that is that descriptions that aren't specific, that are too plain cause more of a pause in that mental processing because we have to try to think and process it. Uh, right. If, if you, you have to something... imagine what it is the author's potentially getting at because yeah, if you, you, if you say it's like a mystery. Very big. <laughs> um, so something's very big. Uh, okay. Well, the last very big thing I saw is probably not the same that somebody else would say is, is very big. It's like, oh, that's not big. You know, so we have to enter into our own minds, try to find a context, something to compare this to, and and then visualize it within the context of the story. And uh, causing that to happen in people, again, offers a break in the flow, a cognitive break in the flow. So it becomes way harder to kind of, quote unquote, see, you know, like Daniel will mm -hmm. say, what, what's, actually, uh, what's actually happening there? Mm -hmm. um, so you want to be specific. Um, where and when you need to. And that's really getting into the details of avoiding things like very large or very big. And the, what's another one that I like is nice. You know, it's a nice amount of, and uh, <laughs> as wishy-washy, you, you know, that's wishy-washy because it's one of the things that people actually say in real life. You know, how was it? It was uh, nice. It was, it was nice. And, <laughs> and yeah. what's the follow up to that? Uh, uh, every single time is, Okay, so what specifically did you like about it? You know, so I need more detail from you to understand <laughs> or, what you're trying to say here. How was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was good. Nice. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Why was it so terrible? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and that's the thing too. Yeah, the good is like, how was it? Yeah, it was, it was good. It's always like, oh, that bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, you, you want to be clear. Um, mm -hmm as much as possible, because it just makes it easier to read. Uh, and yeah. one kind of note or addendum I put on the end of that as well is if, especially in speculative fiction, you know, you're, you're often putting in a lot of effort to create these new living worlds and, and things that are going on there. So, I mean, mm -hmm. shouldn't you really just be specific, give it the life that it deserves, uh, really yeah. get into those details and take us somewhere new um, rather mm -hmm. than trying to rely on 
my own mind's context for things. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take take me on a just, journey. Just a little shout out. Generic descriptions also found in Autocrit's very helpful. Um, because it can again show you where your words are that you probably want to take a look at. Like in this example, you know, look, look is a word that you can use often and there's so many different ways that somebody can look at something and using other verbs can be very helpful. Uh, but things like large, pretty, wide, you know, how large, how wide, pretty is another kind of weasel word somebody said or before, you know, it's kind of a, how that's pretty, you know, it's, or it's pretty something often can be kind of confusing. Like, what do you mean? It, it is that it's kind of like that. So helpful to have these reports at your fingertips so you don't have to uh, do all that research yourself as to where those generic descriptions are, your, you know, yourself. <laughs> all right. You want to move on to the next step, Garrett? We can. And that would be stop repeating yourself, including starting uh, with names, pronouns, and continuous word verbs. Stop yes. repeating yourself. This is our next step for the, the simple line edit. So once we've covered those previous things, um, you're going to go back in. And there's a good reason why, again, this is at this point in the process, because as you're changing things like, you know, you're getting rid of adverbs, you've removed some filler, um, you're rewriting some of these more generic descriptions, getting more specific, is that you're going to have put more, you know, ad additional or <clears throat> different words in there um to to make the writing work still you know in a better way and sometimes that can add additional repetition that wasn't there before because it's easy to go back and think oh i need to rewrite this part so i'll use this phrase that you're always using and all of a sudden it's it's in there more and more and more so this is the spot where you want to hit repetition uh, and really for kind of better or worse repetition draws attention uh, to itself. Um, so that's why you want to nix it as much as possible. Uh, it's a it's a common curse in many uh, a kind of early draft. Um, it takes a lot of time to fix it, to look out for it and find uh, all the things that you are ultimately repeating. But uh, it's well worth the effort because what running into the same word or the same phrase over and over and over again, uh, as you're reading something can do is it again, just pulls you out of the story. It puts your um, instead of sort of looking past or looking through the words on the page, your attention is pulled to the words on the page. You know, you're kind of sucked back to reality and you go, oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> holding a, I'm holding a book here. It's a physical object. I'm looking at printed mm -hmm. words. Uh, so you kind of see the author rather than, uh, mm -hmm. and see the writing rather than the story. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, an example that I use there is of something that, uh, is really simple repetition, which is just repeating the same word. Uh, usually a single word or maybe two word phrase over and over again and in quick succession is something that will really quickly pull you out is uh, you know he opened the door and stepped through letting the door close slowly behind him as the door clicked shut he crept further into the room you know something that we're, we're going door 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 mm -hmm. and you can see how that would be even more distracting if it were uh, if we had a descriptor attached to the door you know like wooden door uh, if we were repeating wooden door three times in two sentences, we're really starting to, that's going to stick in the mind uh, and pull you up. And of particularly it. if the author thinks they're clever too, and they use a more colorful descriptor. Um, yeah. And they just keep reusing it because then I really draw stitch to do itself. And you're like, okay, I get it. That's a really clever way of describing a dog, but you don't have to keep doing it over. And over, and over. <laughs> yeah. There are two things that uh, can stick in the mind even more than, you know, uh, a single word being used um, to stand out re as repetitive really has to be used in quick succession. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if it's spread across paragraphs, we have the same door, the same word like door a few times across a few paragraphs. That's not going to be a problem. That's not going to stand out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only when it's really crunched together. However, people will latch on and remember uh, for a longer time, the longer the phrase is. So if you have two words, three words, four words, five words, the longer it's becoming, the more I'm going to remember it or the more it's going to stick out uh, across a longer span of time. Uh, repetition of an easy, a single word would be really easily fixed. But if you have something, um, I've used an example here. So a screenshot from one of my work in progress, actually, that's in the article, um, is a five five word phrase in an attempt to. And that is something that you don't want to be repeating every paragraph or even every other paragraph, you know, <laughs> it's try to find the longer phrases and make sure you're only mentioning them once or twice throughout. Um, well, I don't want to say once or twice and be so specific about it, but make sure there's 
a big length of time between them uh, so people aren't it's not sticking out this is also uh, quite an easy or quite a good place where you're looking for longer phrases um, to find your darling phrases that you've been using you know if you've come up with a really cool metaphor something you really really like um, yet you find you've repeated that five times throughout the book uh, it's no 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 use it once it's the goal that you deploy once that's that really great turn of phrase a really great phrase that you used just use it the once you don't want to overplay your hand uh, in something like that um, and they can stick out quite often in rep uh, repetition checks this reminds me of uh, this first <laughs> one of my reading parties is gonna matter to me every time i use repetition even for emphasis it's true i mean it is a device and there is a time and place to use it but it's a, it's a tricky one to use effectively it does tend to rub against the reader pretty easily because they are looking for novelty honestly as they read through the book they're not looking for treading they don't want to feel like you're treading water they don't want to feel like you're being uncreative they they want to see progression so yeah i can see i mentioned in the comments there as well about the uh opening of sentences yes um this is kind of tied in with being repetitive as well you you also mm -hmm. want to be careful with how you're using um mm -hmm. pronouns and yep. especially as well continuous verbs at the beginning of sentences two different right. reasons one is of course repetition you don't want uh, this is why a lot of people i think find it quite tough to initially write in first person because you're often tempted to have i did this i did that i i i and every sentence is just i i i i over and over again yes yes that becomes super annoying um you don't want to do very it very easy to do in first person too. it's really easy to do in first person the the easiest solution to that really is just write it out as you do again first draft is what it is um but as you're going back just check how often you're doing that and mm -hmm. every you know second or th third maybe third time you're dropping into i just change the structure of that sentence mm -hmm. draw attention to an object or whatever it is the person's interacting with at the beginning of the sentence rather than saying i opened the box you know give a detail of the box start with the box had or whatever mm -hmm. or the latch made a noise as i opened it that kind of thing so you're mm -hmm. not using i to start every every sentence and of course that goes for other you know if you're using he or she or whatever in a third person uh, narrative so just be careful with that um, when it comes to com continuous verbs and you're starting a sentence there with like opening the door i did this or uh running across the room she did this um, again that will also become repetitive but that's an easy trap to fall into because you can end up uh, describing two things that uh, are happening in that sentence in that piece of action that can't occur together at the same time uh, so you're saying somebody is doing something while also doing something else that they couldn't be doing in that moment uh, that's why i don't like uh, really starting sentences with verbs like that uh, having people in action um you find a way very that. confusing you're just kind of plunging right in the middle of something and then you have to get your footing it's it's tricky <laughs> it can be tricky yeah uh trim or adjust dialogue tags somebody mentioned here i remember encountering the concept that said is an invisible dialogue tag is that the case what would you say quick answer yes, yes right <laughs> Pretty much. Short, yes, I mean, nothing obviously is fully invisible, but yes, we, uh, uh, readers have been trained with said so much that you don't even really read it anymore. It's just kind of there and it just, it falls into the background, which is what a lot of readers look for, especially uh, in modern fiction. It is, it is, co it is commonplace for authors to, to stick with said and asked so that the verb implying speech just disappears into the background. That's very common. Indeed. Before we crack on on this one, I can see Kim uh, mentioned, how do you deal with oh. an opening child's POV? Simplifying the language is killing me. Um, you have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, for being, I guess, authentically in a child's POV, if you want it to sound like them, well, yeah, the language will have to remain simple. However, there's um, framing devices, ways around that. For example, if the story is being told by the person when they're an adult, you could work more adult language into that as a retail because mm -hmm. it's technically a retelling <clears throat> but otherwise yeah did that for you'll just have to to kind of simplify it a little um to keep it natural of course you could simply write it as in your authorial voice then it's but it's not really buried in deep point of view at that point you know there's a difference between deep point of view where you're kind of embedded in the psyche or the mindset of the character who's narrating the the events or you can simply use an authorial 
narrative voice. We kind of get the get the get the deal. So it doesn't necessarily need to frustrate you that much. But if you want to be deep into it, yeah, you're gonna have to deal with the simplification. I was, I was thinking you could even be more of a cheat and just make the kid particularly loquacious, but maybe that's not the <laughs> yeah. leap up there. It's like there's child you know, prodigy in this one. Right, exactly. Maybe not on that level, but like I feel like my son, probably because he's with a blabbermouth father, is a bit loquacious for his age. So some some children are not as simplified in their language. I don't know. So yeah. It's possible. Think about it. <laughs> So on this one, uh, trim or just dialogue tags? Yes, so we're going to move on to dialogue. Now, there's a couple of parts that uh, are attached with dialogue, and one of them is the tags. Uh, you know, as Daniel was saying, in the vast majority of cases, said and asked uh, are going to be your go-tos, um, and they are seen as kind of invisible. You know, they're, they're so innocuous and inoffensive, they don't really modify anything or try to bolster things or really do anything. Um, they just blend into the background. I mean, the... Nowadays as well, uh, and what I tend to feel is is a lot more clean as well, is uh, issuing dialogue types completely. So you can often, if there's a conversation between even two or three people, uh, we can follow it by the cadence of how it unfolds in the back and forth without using tags at all. Mm -hmm. However, uh, where you would use said or asked uh, in a circumstance like that is just to reorientate the reader at the midpoint. So if you feel that, um, let's say it's three people, the person number one says something, um and you have a tag on that person number two says something um and there's no tag on that person number three says something you add a tag so we know that it was person number three that said that not person number one in a response so you can use it to orient it uh, rather than actually doing anything else uh, otherwise if it's two people a lot of the time you can back and forth uh without having to use tags at all however mm -hmm. you could use said or asked um in the middle of a, a conversation like that again to add rhythm to the writing so you want right. that particular rhythm before we hit the next paragraph so that's up to you um now again this isn't to say uh that alternative tones uh, alternative tags uh, aren't necessary or should be used you know should be avoided mm -hmm. completely because uh, some of them do you know if you had like shouted screamed uh even things like yeah, query volume is helpful for sure some of them can show up uh whispered especially is another one of course how are you going to say people are whispering if you don't say the whispered um something like whispered though if you're setting up a, a scene or a stretch of dialogue where people are whispering back and forth you know you don't have to say whispered every time uh you set it up that they're whispering and then we understand that through the context of the scene um and then if somebody shouts something afterwards okay we know they're not whispering anymore you know it's <laughs> it's easy to follow trust trust your reader is one thing we always say trust your reader to follow along with it you just set the initial context uh, as quickly as you can however i tend to avoid alternative things you know as much as possible especially things like uh if you use like quizzed um as a as a dialogue tag or articulated uh things like that not a big fan uh of ones that are really just kind of interchangeable for said without good reason uh or said mm -hmm. or asked um yes too clever by half sometimes yeah it's 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 the dialogue tags really aren't the place to be getting quote unquote creative um it just makes the writing actually appear weaker it's not that you're being more imaginative um or anything it's just not not interesting um and a lot of the times you might actually be using a tag like that to try to get across the tone or what's meant by the content of the dialogue um, and that we should be able to get that from the content of the dialogue and the context of the scene and what we know about the character and everything anyway, uh, mm -hmm. if you're actually telling this story correctly, right. uh, if uh, it's an invo as involving an experience as it should be. So mm -hmm. there's really no reason uh, for them. But that's not to say yeah. you can't use them on occasion. But no. trim them down here. This is the point to start looking for them. Right. And even if it's, I know there are some situations where you may want to get more clever because you're deliberately having them say something, but in a different tone than you would expect. Cause maybe, you know, maybe there's somebody that says something that sounds like something you would yell, but they say it very calmly. Um, you can uh, put that in the dialogue tag to be clear in that way. Mm, but yeah. There are other ways you can do it. You can show their body language before they say it. You can say, you know, they spoke in a soft voice or something. And sometimes that can be better. And the reason why I don't like that information in a dialogue tag is imagine it's, um, I don't know, some outrageous statement like, I just can't take this anymore. And you would think somebody would be like practically yelling that but they're saying it very calmly. If you read that sentence and at the very end, it says they said calmly, it's like you have to do a backtrack in your head 
because you heard it wrong and then you're fixing it. Whereas if the author can clue you into that tone before the sentence, it's better. So that's my thought. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea, a really good point as well. It could be a line something like, you know, Daniel put his head in his hands and spoke softly. And mm -hmm. then the line of dialogue, I can't take this anymore. Right. Delivers versus... it way, way better. Yeah, because and you're getting the same information out, but you're not making the audience do that double take. And that's just more brain power than they need for something simple, which is the tone of how they said something. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on, Gareth. Indeed. We're staying on All dialogue, right. though, because uh, no. this is this is our dialogue run. Now, of course, this uh, being a line edit isn't exactly developmental on dialogue. Dialogue, like I said, is a sort of uh, area all on its own. In terms of what constitutes effective or good dialogue, you know, there's there's entire books <laughs> dedicated to that alone uh, on writing the content of dialogue correctly. However, uh, where we're doing our line edits here, we're going to focus really on the tags we're using. And one of the things to do, this will lead into finding better actual dialogue content, um, which is good at this point, uh, is looking for adverbs in your dialogue tags. Like I said, with adverbs in general before, they're usually trying to bolster something. They're trying uh, to make something um, that's not quite effective be deliver the effect that you're looking for when you should just be precise. Um, and much the same with dialogue tags, uh, adverbs. We're talking things like screamed loudly, said forcefully, mm -hmm. um, huffed angrily, uh, all these kind of things. Again, these are things that should all come through in the context of, of what's going on in the scene. Um, and if you're painting a good picture, such as you know body language, personality, um, what is going on in the scene, uh, how we would expect this character to react. Uh, all of those kind of things make adverbs and dialogue tags almost entirely redundant um, most of the time when they're showing up. So this is a really good opportunity, again, to start focusing on economy of words and start cutting mm -hmm. down uh, that word count. Um, and chances are between this point and the previous point, uh, where you were just kind of looking for ways to change tags or to remove tags altogether so that your, your conversations are just bouncing back and forth. It's a good spot for when you can start looking at the content of that line of dialogue. So for example, if you had somebody say something and you had to put huffed angrily on the end of that to make it just to feel like it actually delivers, because if, if you discover that you take that part out and the dialogue itself feels weak, well, you're going to want to fix that dialogue then make it something different that gets that across uh, without having to rely on the tags and you'll find your dialogue becoming a lot better as a result mm -hmm. uh, one person pointed out sarcasm yes that is one adverb that tends to get used but again i'll go back to what i just said you could have a character say you know have a nice day he said sarcastically but again unless you have the right context you're going to read have a nice day in a oh have a nice day you know or something and you won't know it's necessarily sarcastic and then you have to read that back versus if you have they rolled their eyes have a nice day you know it was sarcastic right so i would again recommend not leaning on that adverb like garrett says um but particularly because the adverb is modifying everything that came before it and changing the context and so you're doing double double work so yeah some of that comes across a lot in body language mm -hmm. um fixing your dialogue in this way you you could often find that I, I i highly recommend doing this is uh framing dialogue with action rather than mm -hmm. simply using tags and moving on mm -hmm. so you could have half of the stated you know the stated dialogue whatever it is they're stating deliver the first half and then introduce a character action in the middle and then mm -hmm. finish the sentence after that action so you get this kind of punctuating beat of uh, of movement and you get the benefit there of, again, more organically delivering the way that they're speaking, um, mm -hmm. but also in anchoring us physically again in the real world. So it's not talking heads anymore. You know, it's not people just talking back and forth in this sea of white space on a page. Uh, we actually are getting them uh, interacting with the physical world in which the characters are present. So they can say something, pick up a glass and take a drink, set it mm -hmm. down and then continue talking, say it again. So it's a good opportunity to find spots where you might actually be uh, missing that and you're spending too long again this floating in a void with these uh, heads just talking in, in white in the, the void of white space and uh, give it some give it some real weight uh, a little bit of heft to, to what's actually happening physically yeah i saw somebody and i'm not seeing the quote now it's how do you imply that there is a pause there's a few different ways of doing that you can 
do the ellipsis points right where we're doing whatever you know and, the, and there's a trail and then whatever but what i generally think works better than that is again going back to body language right and that's something you have to keep in mind too with either a dialogue tag or body language that takes place in the midst of dialogue is that the reader is going to read that as the rhythm of the scene so if you have you know this is an interesting plan he grabbed the cup of water and he drank and then he put it down it's going to be very challenging. You know what I mean? You get the idea he's thinking in that time frame because you're just thinking of, uh, as you read it out loud, you have that rhythm of the motion, right? So that's a way you can get a pause um, effectively, I, I think. What, what do you think, Gareth? What are ways you think to uh, effectively do pauses within dialogue like that? Yeah, pr pretty much exactly like that. Um, you'll break it up with a bit of action in the middle. Of course, trailing into the pause, you can do many different things because it depends on what's going on with the character. If they've said fully finished their previous statement and now they're thinking for a moment, well, yeah, you describe what they're doing as they think, and then they give, like Dana said there, this is going to be a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. So they've thought for that moment, and then they say it. But you can use something like ellipses as they trail off, or if they're cutting off their own sentence, you just, you know, half a word and then the dash on the end um, mm -hmm. will act as though they've just stopped mid-sentence and that could be somebody coming to a realization for example in the moment so they're talking and then abruptly cut off and then he frowned yeah. you're like oh he's just realized something and then says uh, what it is the conclusion that they've just come to so that's mm -hmm. really the best way to do it quite frankly mm -hmm. yeah because sometimes yeah people cut themselves off it's like i don't know if this is he stood looking at the, you know, and you can tell that he's looking at something because he's thinking something through. <laughs> yeah, that could work out well. Yeah, it's just find the the right physical description in terms of body language or whatever they can do that will uh, tell your reader that they're thinking or they've just come to a realization. Usually that's going to be like furrowed brow or, you know, looking at, uh, up, up, up into the corner of the room or looking at an object, for example, that's actually just given them the answer they were in the middle of trying to find as they were speaking. Uh, but they suddenly focus on this object, like, you know, my mouse on the table. Uh, and then they speak. They say what the uh, what the conclusion is that they've just come to. So you can play with it. There's lots of options. But I think that uh, that structure you know, within the dialogue, within the sentences is uh, is the way to do that. All right. So we were covering these different items. I can go back really quick. These are the ones that we said to do one at a time. We were talking about weeding out the filler words, eradicating adverbs, looking for the generic descriptions, not repeating yourself, dialogue tags, adverbs and dialogue tags. But as Gareth uh, mentions in the blog, look for opportunities as you go to reword sentences for clarity and flow. And what pre what precisely are you getting at with this? If there is a precise definition. <laughs> yeah, this is a good spot as you're going. Sometimes if you're a little too overzealous with filler words, for example, you could end up nuking one that uh, makes a sentence impossible to parse um, or adds a rhythmic trip up. Uh, like I said before, mm. sometimes filler words such as that uh, can actually be used to maintain the flow and rhythm of, of the writing as somebody is reading it. So right. keep an eye out for that as you go. And this is a good opportunity, just as you're doing these more simple parts of the line editing process, to make sure that sentences that you're checking and as you're reading through are actually clear, do flow well, that there's no trip up still in rhythm and things like that, because there's alternatives that you can fix. You know, Maybe you're not, it's not related to any of these in this list particularly at this point but it's a good spot to just start catching the little things that you see on your on your on your way through um and fix them up as you go uh, just taking care of little side projects i guess at this point because uh, coming from our previous where we were doing developmental revisions we're very adamant at that point of not focusing on anything else here but when we get to this point we're being a little more open about just things that jump out at you mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it makes sense, obviously, when just because you should be hyper focused on something so you don't overwhelm yourself doesn't mean you have to ignore everything else because <laughs> you yeah. might you might never get back to it <laughs> because right because now you actually have to hold something else in your head and remember to fix that at a, at a later draft. So no, don't 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 be too uh, dogmatic about <laughs> whatever you're thinking about right that moment. You know, it's like, no, I'm just doing filler words. I can't do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're being a little more open at this point. I think uh, certainly your your 100% focus when you're doing any of these passes is the thing you're looking for. So when you're doing filler words, do filler words. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying as uh, as this is a recommendation that as you go through looking at filler words, you also catch an adverb here or there. No, save the adverbs for when you're doing adverbs. Uh, but just look out for things that are obviously typos or broken and uh, a word missing here or there. Uh, don't be afraid to fix those as you go through this time. Not going to be not going to be so strict about it on this run. Sounds good. Um, and then uh, what about passive voice? That's an interesting thing to look out for. Do you have a specific time frame where you think people? It's a good idea to look out for passive construction. Yes, funny enough, comes in next time. Uh, it Ooh, may be the either the first nice or there. second one <laughs> once I we like hit part it. three. Um, I had a feeling it was coming. <laughs> yeah, so the next one, um, I don't believe it's next week because we have our Christmas edition of What's the Score next week. Um, it'll be the 28th, so as we, as we head out the year. Uh, mm. Part three of After the Draft, moving into what uh, we refer to as intensive editing um not that everything we've been through so far hasn't been rather intensive <laughs> because the whole process is uh from start to finish however uh we're entering into some things that are a lot more conceptual in nature things that you really will have to think more about um as a storyteller and you'll get better at with more experience uh as, as you write so they're tougher um that's why we put it into into intensive more more thought needs to go into it and um passive voice will come yeah, up then. two weeks two weeks two weeks however don't miss next week because we have a christmas christmas what's the score but it's a surprise, yeah. right? We just know it's, it's christmas surprise. related right yes yeah. so you like to, you, 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 like, to... you like to make a fun and energy it's a, it's a little gift will unwrap next week. yes you have to unwrap that one for next week <laughs> <laughs> It'll pop open the uh, the advent calendar and see what book falls out quite frankly um, I, keep, I keep waiting for garrett to really surprise me and it's like it's a christmas harlequin romance but no i don't think so <laughs> well it might be i <laughs> we'll find out wow <laughs> so yeah Thanks. tuesday uh, I can see the comments there. Thimble World, yep. Yeah, Tuesday, 21st um, is next week, which is what's the score? And 28th for after the draft part three, which um, if you're actually following along and doing work on your novel, um, we'll give you a good break, I think, to get these first two parts done. Um, crack on through it yes. as much as possible uh, and get through. So part three, yes, intensive editing. There's a number of things there. I won't spoil exactly what's in there, but I'm sure a number of you can probably guess. Uh, based on what's been missing so far uh as we've done here are our simple line edits so yeah we'll move into that conceptual space uh passive voices in there as, as, as we head into final checks because thankfully as well being part three of three it's almost the finish line it is and uh, somebody asked where we can you can see the first part uh it's part of this channel and if you aren't subscribed to this channel please go ahead subscribe like this video ring the bell obviously the more eyes we get on this the more great content we can give you so yeah uh please uh, get involved autocrit's the place to be i'm just saying indeed uh pat uh finding the uh first edition of this yeah it's just on the youtube channel um if you're on youtube watching right now you can click on below the video it's got autocrit it'll take you right to the channel and it's one of the most recent videos it was just last week sounds good well i'm excited for all the great offerings coming up in the rest of this month so i hope to see all of you around and uh, thank you gareth again for your tips and tricks very helpful and uh, i guess we'll see everybody next week right Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope it's useful. Um, I hope uh, if you use it, that you find it beneficial as a as a process or a system. You know the steps to take and order in which to do things because it can be confusing, uh, sometimes Absolutely. overwhelming. Uh, but yeah, stick to it. Uh, hopefully, uh, obviously, let us know when your books are out. We'll buy them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'd love to read them um, and uh, keep up the good work. We'll we'll see you next time. All right. Bye, everybody.